focus on your life, focus on your creation, focus on staying healthy, focus on being the, the very best you can be. And you'll start to feel so much more in control of your life because that is the life you control. Our two guests today are inspirational speakers, authors, and motivational specialists. One is the co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, with over 500 million copies sold and holds the Guinness World Record for the most books at the same time on the New York Times bestseller list. The other is an internationally renowned expert in human potential, offering years of experience and insight into health and wellness. Together, they are sharing some of the important messages from their new book, Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. Please welcome power couple Mark Victor Hansen and his wife, Crystal Dwyer Hansen, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. I'm extremely excited about this one. I've, I've been looking forward to it. Like I say, I came back from Scottsdale um, on Monday from, uh, for a family vacation, and I've been, um, yeah, I've, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for joining us today on the Escape Your Limits podcast. It's ex it's our extremely good good pleasure to be with you, and I'm glad you came and visited even in the hottest time Scottsdale's ever had. Yeah, happy to be here, Matthew. Thanks for having us. Fantastic. So, so what, what, one of the things I was going to ask you, I've I've got a I've been in a family business. I work with my wife and my sister and my mom and my dad. Um, what, what's it like for you guys uh, having a sort of a, a family venture? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because from the time Mark and I met. We just were, were so compatible, and and that's obviously the one of the reasons we came together. Um, we kind of wake up um, every day uh, looking at life in sort of the same way. Um, we want to live life to the fullest. We want to get out there and make a difference as much as we can, and we don't like to sit still. We both love people. We love to travel. So um, all of those things fit in really well with our business model because it's all about, you know, I'm, I'm a transformational life coach, hypnotherapist, and he's obviously author speaker. Um, I'm an author speaker. So we, we travel the world and, and do a lot of leadership training and um, try to inspire people to do their best. Um, and we're really thankful that we have that great compatibility. It makes it really, really fun. Mm. Do you do you sort of separate the two in terms of business and um, and and your you know your your non business life or or are they all just just one of the same thing? You no, know, it kind of blends together, but we do put on our business hats, you know, um, and you know get busy and and we're pretty tough on ourselves when we want to accomplish things and um, we get down to business, you know, and so I think we do. I think we separate, you know, the two. Um, when we're trying to accomplish things, you know, just we're pretty driven and we don't, we don't take things personally. I mean, we're very respectful to each other, but you know, it's like, let's get things done. Yeah. And I, I was, I was reading up and I know, I, um, I know you Mark of, I don't know, I don't know the exact numbers, but it, it, it looks like you've, you've done literally thousands and thousands of sort of face-to-face -face presentations and traveled around the world. I, um, you know, it's a, a crazy schedule, but how have you, how have you coped with suddenly the brakes being put on and, and, and not living life in the fast lane? <laughs> First of all, I love your question. Thank you, Matthew. And, and second of all, I, I respect everybody out there listening. And I know a lot of them are hanging on by their fingernails. And fortuitously, um, you know, Crystal and I are what people tell us we're a formidable couple for which we're very thankful. But we believe in entrepreneurship. We own the Hanson family of companies. And we say an entrepreneur, um, you know, is somebody that does – We've never been connected quite this way before. <laughs> you know, we do, we're traveling. Uh, it, it, we say an entrepreneur finds a problem, solves it for a profit. And and so what has happened is you're right. I've, I've written and sold 309 bestsellers, sold a half billion books, talked in 80 countries uh, to something like 7 million people, I think is the number. Anyhow, um, and we've done $2 billion worth of retail book business and a billion dollars worth of licensing because I created it. And I really, both of us really love business. And, and so what we said is that what is it about all the people that we meet that is different between those who are little success and great success? Because all of them are personable, they're likable, they're well-educated, but their ability is one difference, and that is the ability to ask. And we say you got to ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. And when we start to ask ourselves as, as COVID locked us down, and you'll remember originally it was going to be for two weeks, and now that's six months later, and it's, it's beshmapling everybody. 
And so we said, well, what do we want to do? Well, we want to create money-making products for all the people that are going to be out of work and, and have to have to go back to work. But first of all, we wrote this great little book called Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny, because we think everyone, even in this, has a destiny. And what happens is that adversity is what wakes up opportunity. Adversity is what wakes up advantage if you open up your mind. And what we're saying is, what we discovered is anyone that really learns to ask the profound question of themselves, they have breakthrough illumination, breakthrough solutions, breakthrough understandings, breakthrough insights. And I got to tell you, we've never been busier with people asking us to do stuff, inclusive of a major multi-billion dollar company saying, can you take us from B to B, which isn't working in our industry anymore, from B to B to B to C? And, and you know, my whole life has been all three of those parts of the triangle. So I said, yeah, we could do that. I hope I didn't over answer your question, Matthew. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. That's, um, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So, so I, I guess you know, one of the things um, you, you talk about, you know, one of your superpowers being entrepreneurial and, and you've got a number of books and, and I've even sort of read that you were, um, you know, you, at one point you, and I don't know how you got on, but you wanted to make a millionaires, a million millionaires in 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 a decade it is and and i'm going to sort of go on to ask you a question but the first thing i was going to ask is did you actually achieve that did you did you actually make a million millionaires in a decade we think so here's what happens Uh, we wrote a book called one minute millionaire which was originally written as a movie for warner and then they said well you've got to make it a best-selling book so they only made it a best-selling book we're the only book ever to melt down jeff bezos bezos called up and said I don't know how you guys did that, but get your butts up here. I'm sending you three first class tickets. I wrote it with Bob Allen and our, our inside promoter partner was a guy named Tom Painter. And it was just, it was wonderful because Bezos said, either be the disruptor or be the disruptive. But the first line in the book, One Minute Millionaire, it's half fiction, half nonfiction, has a purple cover, has a butterfly, which is a universal spirit of entre- uh, of illumination, entrepreneurship, and freedom. And and the first line I wrote was, I want to create a million millionaires and and there's one right, easy, perfect and acceptable way to each and every one of us to become a millionaire if we see a problem and we solve it for a substantial profit. And so what's happened is we just right before COVID happened for a second time, we were in uh, Vietnam together and uh, it is the number one book there for the last uh, many years. And it's sort of amazing that the book's going crazy and we have thousands and thousands of millionaires show up, whether we're in China or Russia or there or America. I mean, in America, we had 4,000 people a weekend. We did a $100 million uh, business uh, with 387 employees called Enlightened Millionaire Institute. So I am, and we collected all the millionaires, but there's no way that everyone that makes money with one of our books ever writes in. But we know the numbers passed a half million and, and the book's still selling briskly because they keep sending us royalty checks. So I know that it's working. That's, that's that's incredible, um, and it, it sort of leads on to the question I was I was going to ask. Uh, you know, at the moment, I guess there's a lot of us. We've our businesses have changed. A lot of us could be out of work, on furlough, and 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 I guess things, you know, in a lot of cases look quite bleak. And particularly if you if you decide to turn on the news, which I decided against doing a long time ago. So it's 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 and, and you know people not necessarily wanting to be millionaires, but they just want to be able to sort of have you know keep the house keep the car and have a decent amount you know decent quality of life so in in just be interested uh, for your perspective because you've had a number of businesses and a huge amount of uh, business success is financial success predictable um and regardless of sort of what's going on in the economy so you know some could somebody that's listening to this that's probably just been kicked out of a job there haven't got a lot of money coming in is is are there sort of predictable steps that they can go through to sort of get themselves back on track and and uh, you know not have to be concerned about what's going on at the moment? The answer is one hundred percent yes. Uh, success, wealth, riches, abundance are totally predictable. And a lot of those people that are hanging on by their fingernails back in nineteen seventy four, I went bankrupt and lost two million dollars in one uh, day when I was building geodesic domes. I've been in graduate school with Buckminster Fuller. I built the Wall Street Racket Club, Botanical Gardens, Aviaries. And the Arabs said, we can write checks so big your banks will bounce. So they, um, you know, I had to check a book out of the library, How to Go Bankrupt by Yourself. But the point is, we've now got a book. If they go to my website, we give it free called How to Be Up and Down Times. Because I think everyone's got to read that because we say, hey, look, in this decade, we're going to do 50 trillion. That's not billion. That's spelled with a T. Trillion dollars worth of business. 
but the businesses are different than they were before. Like we have a business that we talk about one of seven that we can turn trash into cash, take every atom and molecule of glass, turn it back, metal back and glass and plastic and water. And why that's important is that just in the United States, we have 10,000 full landfills and there was never one landfill before 1951. And so what's happened is we've got a lot, we all create five pounds of garbage a day, a world round. And we've got to start taking that and saying, hey, wait, this is a good resource in a bad place. And what back to everybody listening, we got to back, we got to say, hey, there's an adversity here, but how do I turn it to my advantage? And that's an individual decision. Like I said, as an entrepreneur, is a problem solver for a profit. So, Crystal, I know, I know, I'd be interested to hear uh, a bit about your story because I know, I know you you got to a stage where you actually went and had to go and, as, as far as I'm aware, go and collect food stamps, and and yes. and you you'd sort of, I guess, hit relatively rock bottom. What you know, what would what did, what what did you do to sort of climb yourself back up? And was it was it more sort of something that happened externally was it a, a mindset change what, what you know just just talk us through what happened there right yeah no i'd love to tell you about that experience it, it, was, it was one of the most difficult experiences in my life and i was very young when it happened um but at the same time i'm really grateful that it did happen i uh, was one of those kids who high school was very easy for me and so i accelerated my curriculum and graduated high school at age 16 and married uh a guy fi five years older than i and two and a half years later, I found myself in a new city with a baby on my hip, absolutely no idea how I was gonna support myself, no family, no friends. And so I really didn't know what to do. So I applied for food stamps. I mean, I thought, gosh, we need to eat. And um, the day that I stood in the line at the grocery store to turn those food stamps over for my food, I had this crazy epiphany. And it was like time slowed down and, and a light was shining on my head. And this question popped into my head. And first of all, it was, how did I get here? And followed by a second question that was like, are you doing everything you can to get out of this or are you taking the easy way out? And the second my mind asked that question, I knew the answer. I knew that I wasn't being my most resourceful. I knew that that I had more inside of me. I knew I wasn't doing everything I could. So I, uh, handed over those food stamps. And honestly, I'll never forget looking at that woman's face, the cashier's face. And she's probably like, what is this fierce look about? Um, Cause I had so much conviction already. I was like, this will not be my future. I didn't say that aloud, but I was thinking it. And I went home and I don't even think I finished those food stamps, but um, I sat down with myself with a pen and paper because I didn't have any answers, but I had questions. And we all have questions, you know? And I, I started asking myself, what, where do I go from here? How, what, what is my big problem right now? Well, it's that I need money tomorrow. So how can I make money tomorrow? And the answer that came to me was I'd heard about these temporary service agencies on the radio. One of them was called Kelly Services. So I called immediately, asked how to fill out the applications. I did it. And the protocol was they would call you and give you job opportunities that fit your you know skills every every day they'd give you opportunities hopefully every day and um, or at least a few times a week and um i started accepting some of those jobs and then i realized that you could sign up for multiple agencies because none of them would know so i signed up for three of them so i had a better selection of jobs and i started working you know to fill in at attorney's offices and started doing like sales at conventions that would come through town and and uh, just different jobs like that. And I started learning something about myself. I learned that I actually had some pretty good business skills and sales skills and that I really liked being in the business world. I loved working with people. And from there, I decided to get my real estate license. So I put myself through a real estate school, you know, real estate training program. It was a few months long and graduated and from the time let's see i was like a, a year and a half maybe a little more from the time that i was turning those food stamps over i was now working for the top home builder in our valley and i became the number one realtor for our company and in addition to that in the meantime while i was going through all of that someone had approached me to um said you know you should do some modeling so i thought why not ask so I went to the top modeling agency in my city and asked them if they would sign me. And luckily they did. Um, I didn't know if they would, but, and I was, I did some national television commercials. I did some television commercials that went national and they ended up airing a lot. So I ended up getting 
amazing uh, residuals, you know, royalties basically for those television commercials and fantastic benefits, which I desperately needed with myself and my son being so little. And so we had like the best insurance available. And I often thought back on that day, I have throughout my whole life, like look back on that time when I was, it would have been so easy for me to just sink into my misery because I felt, you know, I had every excuse. I mean, young mother, no family there. I didn't know what to do, but I'm so thankful that I was able to ask myself those tough questions. And I think more importantly for everyone listening is like to be able to answer yourself with a lot of courage. You have to be courage, courageous in your answers, you know, and be really honest with yourself. Mm. And with, with that, and I, I, I guess it's a great metaphor for people in many different situations, but I, I suppose one of the things that, you know, when, when, when something like that happens, it's like, okay, right, I'm in my apartment. Um, you know, I, I've, I, I, I've not, I've not got a job. I, I don't, or, or, or maybe the business is not looking good. And it, and it's almost like, well, well, where do I start? You know, and, and I, and I know, um, you, you talk about the, um, the sort of the, the mindset and the, and the self image as well, because I guess, you know, if you're, if, if your self image is that you're not great, you've not got anything to offer and it's, and it's, and it's a crap situation, you know, how, how I suppose you could end up asking yourself pretty crappy questions whilst you're in that situation and never get out out of there. So I suppose, how do you, when you don't know what to do, there's no rule book, nobody's going to tell you where these opportunities are. You've got to do something, but how, how do you, how do you sort of get going so that you can get on that roller coaster, which you did? And, and um, yeah, you know, is, is there a sort of methodology in that? Right. You know, we say, Mark and I say in the book that there are three channels through which to ask. And, and those are ask yourself, ask others and ask God. And for me, it always starts with, you know, asking yourself some, some of those tough questions. And we say there are three critical phases to, uh, of questions that you can ask yourself. Right. So the first phase is and these are these phases are so important. The first one is, where am I now? Because we have to question ourselves. Sometimes we just don't even, we can't even get in touch with where we really are. And we can't go forward until we fully understand where we are. So underneath that, you know, where, where am I right now? What's working? What's not working? You know, um, what do I really want for myself? You know, how do I really see myself? Am I holding myself back? You know, what are my opportunities right now? And then uh, just uh, there's so many questions that unfold as you start asking yourself, where am I right now um, in all of the areas of your life? The second critical phase is where do I want to be? Because um, often we are so out of touch with what we really want, right? I mean, when I started asking myself those questions, I knew that is not the life I wanted. I did not like the way that looked or felt. I want to show up and be dependent on somebody else to buy my food for me. That was unacceptable to me. You know, so where did I want to be? And and what's what what will you accept for your life? Um, and asking yourself, where do I want to be? All the questions that come under that. You know, in a, my perfect successful scenario, what does that look like? What am I doing every day? Who am I talking to? Um, what is my what do my business connections look like? Um, what's important to me when I wake up every day, all of those things that come under that scenario of what do I, where do I want to be? And then the third critical phase of that is what specific actions do I need to take to get there? Because we really need to start to look at those and start to move our asking journey forward by taking those actions. Hmm. Do you think uh, that, sometimes that you can you can actually sort of get yourself into a into a bit of a state um you know one of the things i find helpful is if you know i have a tough day and i go out for a run and when i get back suddenly the world seems very very different no matter how bad it looked like before <laughs> the world changes so how do you see a sort of a connection with you know when you make some sometimes my thoughts are spinning around the head and it's like well this isn't great and that's happened over there and this person was unhappy on the phone call uh, and, and you can just keep questioning and saying, well, everything just looks crap today. But, you know, is is there a connection between sort of health and fitness and, and then, you know, helping you get on a better level with you, with your thinking? 
totally, totally. Well, your brain works better, you know, when, when you're releasing endorphins um, and blood's flowing to your, to your entire body. And also it becomes, it's so much easier to reach a meditative state because when you're exercising, your, bl- your brain wave actually goes into a slightly hypnotic state. It's a dreamer state. It's the, the artist state. The artist state, the dreamer state is the one that is the creative state where you can start to, you know, kind of dream and wonder and also re- receive feedback from the universe. Like you, you start to get understanding. So Mark and I cannot survive literally without exercise every day we try to i mean there are a few days where it just doesn't work out but either we're outside hiking or we're like this morning in the gym yeah but one of the reasons we we come to flagstaff when airs when uh scottsdale's so so hot is because we need to get outside that is part of our meditation that is part of our breakthrough time and honestly i I hope everybody on this podcast is already doing their exercise, but it's, that's one thing you just can't skip, especially right now when we're all in this state where, where we need all the help we can get to move forward to the, and to stay strong. Mm. Do you think like you, you talk, obviously the book is about, it's called ask. Um, do, do you find like every like in everything, whether it's weight loss and, and, and health and, and that, that there's a, that, that you train yourself, and create, you know, asking good questions as a habit. So can, can you, is it, is it something that you've got to, you can't just sort of say, well, I'm going to ask good questions. You, you've got to practice. And then over time you actually get good at, at, you know, asking better and better questions over time. Or is it, you know, tell me a little bit about how that process works. Uh, you've asked two questions at once. If you yeah. don't mind, I'm going to bifurcate it and go back a little bit to what you asked Crystal. And that is first thing you got to do is, Ask, you know, you ask yourself, ask others and ask God. But when you, when I was bankrupt and upside down in 74, I kept saying, basically, God, what's your destiny for me? And you do it 400 times. God, what's your destiny for me? What is it you want me to do, God? And that fits for everybody right now, because, you know, like you said, you go out and run and you perspire and you sweat and that cleans out your stress level. There's no question about that because there's three kinds of stress. There's you stress, EU positive stress, which I'm going to talk to stress, just day-to-day hassles. And then there's what we're all in right now, which is de-stress. De-stress wrecks the human body, wrecks the human mind, debilitates the soul. So we want to get rid of that. And exercise is, is a paramount to doing that. And just for myself, we were on a vacation in Newport Beach, staying at the Balboa Bay Club, curiously enough, like a month ago. And I come out of the restroom and this guy and I are chatting, just having a good time and hating the mask. But I could see that the guy was, a, you know, we, we do a lot of work with the military. So, you know, a special ops guy. I mean, they're so solid. They're rigorously solid. And and he said, yeah, I do 500 push-ups a day before I go out in the day. And it so impressed me that I said, hey, wait a second. I'm going to do that. So, for the last month or two, I've been watching all the heavy-duty guys, whether it's Arnold or Sylvester or Terry Crews or whatever, when I'm exercising. And I forgive me for bragging, people, but I am. At 72 years young, never, back to one of the first things you said, Matthew, I, you got to be very strict with your languaging in addition to asking the right question to get the right result. Because I said the wrong question was, how do I go bankrupt? Bingo, I went bankrupt. If you say, how do I become a millionaire? Your mind starts teleologically figuring out how to become a millionaire. If you say, how am I going to be in the most robust, wonderful rip roaring health of my life because my intent is to live to be 127 with options for renewal and if you have a high quality of life you have a high quantity of life and we are in unequivocally the most breakthrough time in human history where yes we take all the nutraceuticals yes we exercise both with resistance training and hiking and running and all that but then additionally you know i wrecked my knees i needed stem cells and then we were on a program in silicon valley with arguably the smartest guy ray kurzweil who wrote if you live long enough you live forever and he said the next issue is you're going to issue and regrow your own heart, your liver, and all that, all of which we're doing right now, and you're going to do it with 3D printing. And then he goes on to say that he's going to live to be 350 <laughs> years old, which I'm not sure I want to live that long. But um, <laughs> I'm not sure I don't. But if remember, we're, we're our model, back to your question about health, is health is number one. Everyone says, well, love's number one. No, it's not. If you aren't healthy, if you've got stuff in your nose and you're electronically alive, you're not alive. So we want to have great health then love, then freedom. Right. 
And you said you said the most dangerous one is is de stress. Just I, I I sort of missed that. What, just 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 sort of explain what 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 you mean by that de stress again. De stress. If you spend right now, so many people we're telling people talk, shut off the television. Fifteen minutes is all you can take of all this nonsense, right? Because they are ODing you, trying to they're trying to squelch. The, the America, they're trying to squelch the human spirit because if it was only in America, I'd say, look, it's totally pol politicization here in America, but it's politicization in literally all over Europe, all over Asia, all over Africa. Nobody's getting free right now and they're trying to take control of us. And and I believe what I said, the third thing is freedom and, and the way they're holding us down and you can't go here and you got to wear a mask all the time. This is dehumanizing the human being. Right. And can I say, Matthew, I think I would define the, the different, two different types of stress or good stress is the type that you have control over. Like I put, you know, pressure on myself to get things done and to accomplish things that Mark and I do and we'll push each other. That's good stress. The, stress. Bad, the bad stress is when you're, you keep looking at the news like you were saying earlier. And you're looking at all these insane, crazy things. And it seems like the world is falling apart because that's what the media loves to focus on, right? Because it's so sensational. Um, and you go, I, I don't have any control over that. The, the world's falling apart and I don't have control over that. That is the worst kind of stress. And it's, a, it's an illusion anyway, because you know, as a transformational life coach and hypnotherapist, I say as much as it seems like you know, your life is experience is created out there somewhere and it's coming at you and you're trying to duck and dodge and you know, that sort of thing. The reality is what you experience as life is created in here, right between, you know, your ears. It's created in your own mind. So be willing just to shut that off. Um, unless you're gonna go and become a politician and join in and do something that you can really do something about. Um, obviously vote the way your heart and conscious say you should vote. And, you know, but beyond that, I mean, focus on your life, focus on your creation, focus on staying healthy, um, focus on being the, the very best you can be. And you'll start to feel so much more in control of your life because that is the life you control. Hmm. I know you, you talk a lot and a lot of the materials that you guys do are, are focused around the mind. And, and one of the things it's, 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 it's been something that I've been thinking about for a number of months and I've, I've sort of been trying to work it out myself. I'll be interested to hear what you think. But I, I guess from what I understand, you know, your your mind and the health of the mind is that's basically what the life that you're living in. So, if, you know, if it's all messy and unfit, it's going to be a messy and unfit life. And if it's great, it's great. So but but then, and I was thinking, well, what what it, what controls the mind? You know, do, do we control it? in terms of like, do, do I control my mind so I can decide whether it's a good and a healthy one or not? Is there something like you talk about, you know, people asking through, you know, yourself, others and God, does something outside of us control it that we've got no control over? Or is it a little bit of both? What, what, <laughs> what, what's your, uh, <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a that? great question. So we have a tremendous amount of creative control over our life and our thoughts and how we feel about ourselves in our lives every day. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's funny you said that mess in your mind because I call it messy thinking. And a lot of that messy thinking we do is programming from our childhood or our lives that, you know, and we talk about the seven, seven roadblocks to asking in this book. That's, that's part of the same thing. We're conditioned and programmed from life where we get shut down and we get stopped and we want to ask for something more. And, we're, we're invalidated or marginalized and pretty soon we stop asking. And so we carry around this baggage of unworthiness, um, doubt, fear, um, and, you know, disconnection from our own dreams. And it, it becomes a really sad state. But what we need to do is recognize it. The first step to creating a better mind and thereby creating a better life experience is just realizing that all of that baggage that you're carrying around really doesn't have to be there. You can ask a new question um, and you don't have to accept, you know, is, is, are those things, those beliefs about yourself, are you really unworthy of having success? Of course, of course not. You know, um, are you really dumb? No, of course not. You're brilliant. You're, you have an amazing mind. Um, so you need to 
really be willing to sit with yourself and, and recognize that those negative programs that are running through your mind sometimes and stop keeping you from doing things, keeping you from asking for your best life can be changed. And the first step is awareness. You just have to be aware that those aren't you. Those are pieces of baggage that you keep carrying along through your life. Put down the baggage and let it go and just realize that you get to start your life every day anew. And then to the spiritual part of it, Yes, I do believe we're doing this divan this dance with the divine every day. I mean, the creator of the universe really created amazing an amazing universe, and the universe responds to us. So it's interesting. Um, the more you anticipate and expect wonderful good things, and the more you give gratitude for the for the amazing things you have, the more you become a magnet for those things. It's it's the magic button for God's perfect universe. You know, we're allowed to have so much creative power over our lives. So it's a combination of both, you know, we're working with the divine all the time. Hmm. How, how do you, how do you sort of, um, I, I guess sometimes you can, your mind can play tricks on you and how, how do you sort of separate that truth from, you know, you, you sort of saying, well, you know, I, I can do this and I can, I can achieve the impossible and 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 sort of I guess be a, you know delude yourself with that or or you know is that what you should be doing? It's like look, I'm not going to have any limitations. I'm like like what you said, I'm going to live to 127 or 300. You know, forget about whether it's true or not. That's what I'm going for, and, and I'm going to block everything out of my mind and and just turn all that stuff off. Or do you do you sort of rationalize with yourself and say, well? Yeah, maybe, you know, like I, as an example, then so I'll, I'll pause it. Like I, I read that you, um, you know, like 144 rejections when you did the chicken soup of the soul, which is a hell of a lot of rejections. You know, I think most people have probably stopped at four or five. You know, what what did you do? Oh, yeah, maybe one or two. You know, it, it seems like an insane amount of rejections. And, and, and what made you sort of think that, well, is this really a good book? You know, maybe people are telling me something that I should just go and, you know, get into banking or something. So what, what was, was that just, you thought, sod it, it is going to work. And it, it went on to sell, sell half a billion, you know, half 500 million copies, half a billion copies. So obviously it was the right thing to do, but I, I'm just curious because you can talk yourself out of something because you're just going on and you're not getting anywhere. And when do you throw the towel in? I know there's a bunch of questions there, but <laughs> right. I, I'm going to do half it. I'll have Crystal do something about Charlie Green in the second half because it's better coming from her than me. But um, what, what's true is, is that I've been selling since I was nine years old because uh, my parents didn't have any money. They were Danish immigrants, and I had one to buy my own bicycle. And Dad said, um, "Pride of ownership follows pride of earnership," and I bought into it and sold more greeting cards than anyone. So I'm pretty much rejection proof, and I ask boldly. <laughs> And, and uh, Jack and I knew that it would work because uh, every audience gave us a standing ovation. They said the same thing uniformly. Do you have that story or that story that helped me? I need to take that story home to my brother or sister, or this or that. But we had a guy named Charlie Green attend a giant talk. Would you talk to that? It was fun because we uh, he submitted this story for our book, for the book Ask. And um, he said in, in the early days before Mark wrote, had Chicken Soup for the Soul published, Mark was speaking. He was a very well-known speaker at the time, a uh, very beloved speaker. And he was speaking at a, at a big church in the Midwest. And Charlie Green was one of the people in the audience. And he said, Mark you know, gave us this phenomenal talk that we were just so inspired and touched by. And then at the end of the talk, he kind of grabs this manuscript and waves it in the air and says, you know, I'm going to ask all of you to pray with me now. This is the manuscript for my new book, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And I need to get a publisher and I want you to pray with me that this is going to sell a million copies. And they're all like, okay, you know, everybody joined hands and prayed that this book was going to sell a million copies. And he's like, and now I'm going to ask one more thing. I've got these order forms here and I want you to put your credit card down and order, order the book. And when, as soon as it comes out, we'll send you the copy. And Charlie goes, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Everybody filled out an order form and gave their credit card for a book that didn't exist <laughs> because Mark was, first of all, he gave us so much value and, and we just loved him so much. And he was so convinced and so solid that this book was going to be the greatest book of all time. 
And he believed so much that we, we believed it. So that goes back to your question, Matthew, is it, we believe that I will sell a billion books over time. And what we believe is that every, we're going to get a, a million of these out in people's hands because yesterday or so we got 121 letters in one day appeal that already read the book's only been out a little over a month and our publisher called us right before it came out and he had COVID and we didn't know it at the time. And he said, do you want to push that back? And I go, I didn't know he was sick. So I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to push it into the political foray. I said, I don't know how we're going to sell it, but we'll do it. And we've done 60 or 70 podcasts. And I said, you know, I want to sell a billion books on a couple of the podcasts. And dang, if, if two of the biggest podcasts, which have over 10 million people, didn't say, I'm going to help you sell a billion books. And I, I wasn't asking them personally. I was asking the audience <laughs> generally. What, what, what your question was is, is it beneficial to think big? Well, I've got a whole set of tapes. How to think bigger than you ever thought you could think. Because if we let Jack do it, we wouldn't have done this. Because I, I bodaciously think outrageous thoughts that because imagination is the only room without any limitation. And you've got to ask yourself to wake up the imagination. And everybody right now, 8 billion of us alive, have all been locked down at one level or another. And some are getting more freedom. And most of us are not getting the freedom we want. At least we're not. And, and it, we're more free than 90% right. of people because we're rich. But the fact of the matter is, it's everyone's duty, responsibility, and obligation to fulfill their destiny, become rich, be as healthy as they can, be as happy as they can. Because the reason to be alive is full of joy and, and two C's, creativity and contribution, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you don't agree with that, I'll listen to any argument, and I won't jump up and down and be mad. <laughs> Until I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I do agree with that, and and just just to sort of stay on that for a moment, then. So so if you if if you are question sort of talking yourself out, like you know, I, I guess you could argue. Let's talk about our industry, the fitness space. You could argue that because of the restrictions and what's going on in the world, that that this business is never going to be the same. It's always going to be difficult for people to go into gyms, and and you could make a bloody good argument that that okay it's not going to happen and i need to sort of you know throw the towel in and think of something else or you can make an equal argument to say well this is the best thing that's ever happened for xyz um both of those i, I guess are arguably true one of them will help you one of them won't but but when you get into that way of thinking which i've been you know with our business as i said one, you know one day we woke up and 99 percent of our customers were closed and we're not got any money coming in and and you know it's a horrible place to be and you and you do start thinking well I, you know <laughs> what am I going to do next so how do you you know do you just sort of ignore what you think is rational and just say I'm going to focus on the best thing I can focus on and and forget about any facts that support it that may talk you down from doing it well first of all I want to tell you the same thing happened to us we had two giant talks booked I mean one with 11,000 people in Washington, D.C., and one in, and we had seven, but two big ones within a couple of days, and one in Florida with um, uh, 15,000 people. There's a lot of people to buy books and tapes and, and pay us our, our enormous fees, which are outrageous. But, you know, <laughs> I've been doing the business 44 years. The, the guy calls up and says, hey, uh, it breaks my heart to tell you this, but I just lost $5 million because the hotels aren't giving me back the money, and, and no one's going to come out, and you're done. And so we had a re-pivot. That's what I was saying is everyone's got to pivot. And just real quick to the health industry exactly, we went into a, a sports store. I don't know. I don't want to advertise any particular sports store, but we went in and we tried to buy some weights and some ankle weights and stuff. They're totally slam dunk sold out. And and uh, I, I don't know that you guys can't manufacture or what, but our, our villages, which is, my wife will tell you, the one of the other reasons that we came on this little mini vacation to Flagstaff is because we love our health club. We go there when we're in town every day. It, it's fabulous. It's one of the three best we've ever been to in the world. And, and it breaks our heart because we want to exercise. We want all the technology. But today you can't even buy the technology. So what I'm saying is I don't know what the pivot is. Just like I didn't know that we would be doing these podcasts and figure out how to talk to 100 million people before Christmas and sell a million books. But we had a pivot, and, and as a result, like I think I told you, we've done 60 or 70 podcasts. We'll do way over 100 uh, by the end of the year. And if you have somebody that wants us on a great podcast, we'd love to do it anywhere in the world, which the, the, one of the biggest we were on with 10 million people in Vietnam blew us away the next day the results we got. So 
you've got to be willing to pivot. Well, and I just want to, I don't believe Matthew for one second. First of all, we need to all understand how we are probably in the most um, intensely competitive political environment we've ever seen, ever. It's it's the most polarized political environment, and a lot of things are being done that are, I would just want to say, exacerbating this situation for all of us. I do believe in, what is it, 90 days after this election, things hopefully will get more sane, hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you can hang but, on. You know, um, come on, exercise is, is what keeps us healthy. Exercise is what keeps our immune system alive and awake. It is the most important thing. If you could pick one thing, I mean, diet and exercise, you know, but gosh, I, I am very hopeful and optimistic. I think, you know, don't forget the power of the people. We're not going to put up with not having places to go to work out. So all of this has to be reconciled and reconciled very soon. Um, I'm absolutely convinced. Um, and this will pass. This will pass. Mm. We're all going to come mm. back. Yeah. So when, when you, I know, I know you went, um, I, I'm not sure of the term you call it, but in England we call it going bankrupt or going bust. And I yep. know you've you've been there before. What, when when you sort of got over the, the trauma of doing it, what and you talk about asking good questions, what were some of the good questions that you started to ask yourself? Okay, so I was bankrupt and I'm so poor so fast. I'm sleeping <laughs> in a sleeping bag in front of another guy's room for six months. Uh, really depressing, and and there's the lowest part of my life, and, and and unfortunately, I thought my self worth and my net worth were the same. I've now, and I want to tell everybody out there hanging on because you're wondering whether you can, you know, you're at the end of your rope. I'm going to say tie a knot and rope and hang on for just a little bit longer, because like Crystal was saying, we think it's close to being over. Um, but I, I woke up with this idea that I wanted to talk to people that care about things that matter that would make a life changing difference. And I went, I was living in Hicksville, Long Island, New York. I went to my three roommates at breakfast. And I said, hey, you guys, do you know anyone that's young, not a medical doctor, not a lawyer, not a celebrity, not a famous person that's making a living talking? Because that's what I think I want to do. And the guy said, yeah, guy's a few years older than you, but he is going to knock your socks off. He's out in Hop Hog, Long Island, New York. I went out and watched this guy, Chip Collins, speak for three hours and mesmerized 500 people. And I went up to him at the end. I said, I asked him, I said, may I invite you to lunch? I want to learn how you do what you do, Chip. He said, I'll let you buy me lunch, but you can't do what I do in, in real estate because I own the five boroughs here. I'll teach you how to do it if you'll stay in life insurance, which I said, look, I'll do anything. I want to try this business. And without owning any life insurance, without knowing what a premium was, without knowing what a CLU was, I knew zip. And the first day I sold one in 10 people that I called on. The second day I sold two. And within the first year, I'd done a thousand talks and I, I'd done a total pivot, like I'm saying. I had to reinvent myself. And then this, the, after the first year, everyone said, boy, you are the best storyteller. Do you have that story in a book? And I said, well, I'll do a book. I'd made about 75 grand speaking. And I did a little book called This Is Ask. But it was called Stand Up, Speak Out, and Win. And I sold it from a platform, 20,000 copies at $10 each. I took in, I tripled my income. I made about $200,000. And everybody, I said, this isn't a New York Times bestseller. This isn't an international bestseller. This is my bestseller. <laughs> and everybody got in my autograph. And I thought, man, I have died and gone to heaven. This is the best business for me. Now, all I'm trying to do is do it as an example. Because every one of you, if you go deep, remember, the subtitle here is Dreams to Your Destiny. You have a destiny. If you're alive, you have a destiny. It's your job to find it. you got to go into the deeper, innermost, hiremost. The bigger self, not the little self. The little self, back to your thing earlier, Matthew, asks the wrong questions and says, oh, just turn on TV and have a beer or vodka or whatever the hell you drink, right? The bigger self says, hey, wait a second. I'm going to I can exercise and be disciplined. I can mentally be disciplined. I'm going to read self-help action books like Mark and Crystal White and, and some other people write that really they'll, they'll give me what Zig Ziglar called a checkup from the neck up and I'll take flight again. Because there is a way for me to succeed, even in this industry. And if this industry isn't right, then I'll figure out the next transformation that I've got to go through. Because you, none of us can look at butterfly and see the transformation, I mean, caterpillar, and see the transformation into butterfly. And everybody listening, watching, and thinking with us 
is in, we're inviting you to become a butterfly and we're inviting you to do it free. Get our book at Amazon because that's ever, everywhere. But we have a, a book club we invite you to free called askthebookclub.com. Ask, askthebookclub.com free. And we're going to help you become a master asker so you get to fulfill your destiny. Mm. And in your book, you talk about that everybody's got one and it's there to, that, you know, your job is to, to discover it. And I suppose at the moment when, you know, maybe people are maybe in a, in a business or in a role which they probably could accidentally have ended up in. And I suppose it gives them an opportunity to pause and say, hey, you know, is, is this really my destiny? Um, question, question to Crystal. What, what are some of the things that you've found have, um, have, have, whether it's a process or, or, or whatever, to, to sort of help you uncover that? Because I, I, you know, I suppose every, I, I talk to a lot of people and like, you know, I don't know what my talent is or my destiny. You know, maybe this is it, maybe it's not. How, how do you go about find, <laughs> finding one? Well, you know, one of those things is just to really, um, you know, take that personal time with yourself and start asking yourself the questions. And I think one of the most important questions you can ask yourself is, what is it that I do that makes me feel truly happy? You know, there's always something and it has to something now, you know, I'm happy watching a movie, but no one's going to pay me. I'm, <laughs> I love movies. I'm not, no one's going to pay me for that. So you have to say, what, what, what can I do that can pay me a, a substantial amount of money that when I'm doing, I feel really, really happy. And I knew for me, I mean, there are a lot of things I can do, you know, I'm pretty good at, at, whatever bookkeeping but you know what i know when i ask that question it does not make me happy at all <laughs> and so you know but my bookkeeper jen gets all excited she cannot wait to like reconcile everything it makes her really happy to get all her clients books all straight you know so it, it's different for everyone what makes me really happy and satisfied when i'm doing it and and was i happy and satisfied doing what i was doing before and also what makes me feel more purposeful you know, for us having a purpose or having meaning. And it doesn't, you know, sometimes people think, well, that means I have to be on a stage speaking to a million people. But it, it doesn't really mean that either. I, Our daughter is a school teacher and she talks all the time about when schools were open, this janitor that is loved and adored by everyone. He is such a special man because he knows how hard the teachers have it. And they're always trying to dip into their own pockets and you know, buy things for their students and just make it a better, fun environment for their kids. Well, he goes the extra mile and he comes in over time and he builds little things for them. And just he does it with so much love. Well, he ends up getting, you know, thousands of dollars in bonuses from the teachers who reward him with, you know, nice restaurant gift certificates and store certificates because they love him so much. He does something for him that is so meaningful. You know, so I think like tapping into that thing where you your heart starts to feel good. I think that's really, really important. And then one of my favorite questions is that I ask God all the time is, God, will you please show me how to be my greatest expression for which you made me? You know, I don't, I don't know always exactly what that is, but keep showing me. Keep showing me what I was made for, you know, and that's a powerful thing because when you start asking that question of God, you will just amazing things will show up and it's like, wow, that was easy. You know, you get an answer. Somebody calls you and they're like, we really want you to do this or things just start to connect. And it, and it really is a magical process. I, I tell everybody the universe, our world is a magical place if you're willing to embrace the asking journey and really believe. And we say there are three, you know, you, you need to prepare to be a book, good asker. And the first part of preparation is belief. And that means you have to believe those answers are out there for you somewhere and that you're going to, you're going to receive them. And you have to believe you're worthy of the answers. And the second part of preparation is, is action. Because sometimes we start asking and we get a hint, we get, you know, we, someone calls us right after and it seems like the perfect connection or an idea comes to our mind. Well, if we don't pick up the phone and act on it, if we don't take that next action step, it won't lead us to the next you know, step in our journey or it won't start taking across us across that bridge. Be prepared to, you know, first of all, believe and then take action because we have to continue to put our asking journey into action. And, and then the final part of preparation is using that beautiful imagination that you have because 
It is the greatest gift God gave you. We're the only animal that can imagine, that can create something completely out of our minds. And if you think about it, every single thing that has ever been created, every painting, every, every technology breakthrough, everything we have and love was created from someone's imagination. So you have that same ability in your imagination. You just need to tap into it more often and go into that space and say, what is the most amazing thing I could be doing? What is my ultimate idea of success? Like we were talking before and go to the nth degree of your idea of fulfillment in your life and then start to engineer it backwards by asking those questions. Mm. It, it sounds like it, it requires effort, um, you know, going through that process. I, and I guess it's easy, particularly nowadays, you know, you've got, everyone's got one of these and you've got Instagram or Facebook or what have you. And I suppose when, when you think, when I listen to what you're saying and you think it through, probably a lot of times we're not actually thinking, whether it's TV, we're just sort of almost switched off the brain from thinking yeah. and, and we're just sort of going along in this sort of, you know, autopilot. Do you think with this process that you're talking about or this framework, do you, is it something that you have to create these rituals where, where you guys, for example, together, you, every day you have this time where you're you're thinking and you're asking these questions because it I, I guess one of the things with with all of these books and stuff you read is that you know at some time you've got to as you just said you've got to put it into action but is is there like this thinking time where you just shut off and you whether it's meditation or whatever and you you go through and if so what is what what it, what have you found is a good way of fitting that into your your lives well, for us, perfect question set up is that the first hour of every day, we pray and meditate together. And, and for us to somebody else, we say, look, get a copy of the book and go through the questions with your significant other, with your mastermind partner, or with your associate, somebody else that really cares and wants more for you than you want for yourself. Because they, back to your question, the one before this, ask 10 of your friends that you really trust to write out what do you see as my skills, my talents, my abilities? And most importantly, what do you see as my superpower? Because back to your thing from the beginning of this thing, Matthew, most people never get to their superpower. Now, my superpowers are only four. I, I am pretty good as a writer, speaker, you know, a leader and a visionary. And that's it. And an and entrepreneur visionary, I guess. But it, that's what, you know, I am really good at. I mean, I can see the trends of where the market's going to go and figure out where and how to make money. But if you're, if that is not your skill, then you buddy up with somebody like me and there's plenty of me's out there. And it turns out that because we've been doing all these seminars on podcasts more heavily with entrepreneurs than any other single group, there's not an entrepreneur that we've talked on. We've talked on at least four or five podcasts with billionaires. Every one of them is trying to do exactly the same thing, uplift people now because they're all feeling the, the despoilment of the human soul because it, it's heavy if you watch TV, which is what mm. Chris was talking to. I mean, you go, ah, I'm going to kill myself. This is terrible. But it, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, we're almost over. It, it, you know, we're going to go into better times. I, I really, in my heart and soul, believe that. I'm holding up the mirror, Crystal and I, and we're asking you to look at it and say, hey, wait a second. What is the best iteration of my soul from here forward? What is it that I could do that maybe I've never done before that would make me bigger, stronger, healthier, happier, more enriched? and help a whole lot of other people source and serve at the same time. Yeah. And you, you, um, you talk about sort of fear and, and, and the news. And I know, I know you, uh, I know you sort of talk about the, the three different types of fear. And I, I guess when you, when you start allowing what, what they talk about in the news and how, how bad things are, it, it can, you know, it can it can sort of debilitate you, and 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 so I, I wonder if you'd mind just talking through those those three different fears, and uh, and what you know what what you do to to just kind of take them out of your lives. All right. Well, first of all, what I did when I was bankrupt is just what I said is no one should listen to the TV or read negative news more than fifteen minutes a day. That's all you got to you got to discipline yourself. Back to your question about habit, you got to make it a habit not to let the bad news in, but to program yourself to positive mental attitude or prosperity mental attitude. And the way I did that as I, back in 74, I started listening to audio tapes. Now I listen to podcasts when I'm on the elliptical or whatever, I'm warming up or I'm, you know, doing curls and, and or if Chris and I are walking, 
you know, then we're talking. But otherwise, if I'm listening, I just put in my earphones and I listen to the most buoyant stuff, both in business and in exercise and in spirit, because how are you going to grow? So the point is you learn to do what FDR said, confront your fears and make it disappear. And then you say, ask yourself, what is it that I can do to source and serve? As we have in the book, uh, Peter Demandis' question, one billion people during this decade. And if you make that many better off, serving you have to become vastly rich because if you got one dollar from every one of those people you serve one way or another you're going to become a billionaire in a decade and there's more ways to make more money now than ever before and every industry is going to have to figure out how to do it and that's why i said in your industry it may go from b to b where you're selling to studios and and uh, big uh stores and maybe we're going to have to sell uh directly b to c to the customer because like right now, if, if I knew that you were selling it and your price is fair and I can't get it at the sports store I went to because I'm, you know, I've gotten stronger. Like I told you, this guy's inspired me and I'm watching all these videos that I want to go to the next level of my own strength and fitness. Yeah, we, we, we can we can definitely uh, we can definitely help you out with that. That's that's for sure. Huh? So. So what, what, what do you, what, you know, in your, his, in your sort of uh, time as an entrepreneur, you know, but what would you, would you say you could sort of boil it down to sort of one key thing that holds people back? And I, I guess to, to both of you already, but, but if, you know, if, if, is there one sort of major thing that holds people back from getting where they should be and what their potential is financial or, or, or based on their destiny? Is it, is it something that, that, that's just common across is everything that, that really sort of holds holds people back? Yeah, it's such a great question, Matthew. And, you know, it goes back to what we talk about, the seven roadblocks to asking are really the seven roadblocks that people carry. And those are, you know, unworthiness, which is just this childhood conditioning that makes us feel like we don't deserve better somehow. There's just like this little subtle thing. I don't, I don't really deserve this. I'm really not good enough, right? And it just happens over a lifetime. And then... Oh, second one is naivete. Sometimes we just don't know what's out there. You know, when we're looking for something new or something, I, a new idea, maybe it's something we weren't exposed to. And I, in the book, I tell the story of uh, this, you know, young, this woman, Filipino woman who took care of my children when they were little and she'd cook all these great dishes for us every day. And one day she showed up with this fruit and cut it up on a plate and handed it to me. And I tasted it and I was like, Melda, this is the best fruit I ever tasted. What is this? And she goes, it's a mango. And I'm like, a mango? How come I've never had a mango before? And I, I thought I was so worldly. I traveled all through Europe, done all these different things. And I go, where did you get them? Thinking she imported them from the Philippines. And she goes, at the grocery store. <laughs> and I was like, how did I miss mangoes? You know, it seems so crazy to me. How did I miss the best tasting, juiciest fruit ever? But, you know, it's, it's such a lesson in life. We all do that because we're naive. We're just naive. So, and we're not curious enough. And that's part of the asking journey. We talk about in the beginning of the book how we're all these beautiful master askers. When we're born, we want to know who, what, when, where, why, and we want more, more, more. We just keep asking, right? And then that gets shut down by this unworthiness that we're talking about. So we need to all of these different roadblocks, actually. So we're saying we need to rekindle that and take, you know, not be naive. What, what other people are we missing every day? We're passing them by and we don't realize that could be the most amazing connection we've ever had. And I started questioning myself about that. What other opportunities am I missing because I'm naive? Um, the next one is excuses. We make a lot of excuses um, because we're either, you know, those people that are just too stubborn to ask for help or, you know, inquire about anything. No, I don't need help. I can figure this out. Well, that doesn't get you ahead. That, that leaves you exactly where you are. So some of those things we need to get over. Um, doubt. Doubt is just sort of that gray area that well, no, I don't think anything's that good is ever going to come out of this. So I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to exist at this gray level of life. Um, the other one is is uh, just fear. I mean, the, the terror of rejection is so powerful with people. And I think it comes down to our need to be loved because, um, you know, all human beings need to be loved. And, and if we're if uh, we're so afraid of rejection because it feels like we're losing love or losing approval. And uh, the next one is pattern paralysis. It's just, you know, doing the same thing week after week, month after month, year after year, and it's not working and it didn't work last month or the week before or the year before, but we keep doing it. And why, you know, why aren't we stopping to question that? Why? And, and so 
you know, all of these, all of these roadblocks are the same things that stop us from pretty much everything in life. And the last one is disconnection. And that is just being disconnected from your dreams. It's that state of apathy where you kind of give up and you just, you kind of give up and lose hope. And that's really sad for me. That's the saddest one of all, because I don't want anyone to give up on their life. Your life is so important. Your life, you are so valuable. And there's so much more for you if you just embrace this journey. And, you know, sometimes we have to just step on our fear with courage. Um, I know it's hard, but we have to just, the first step is really reading, reading through these stories and understanding other people's journeys that other people feel just like we do, but they found a way to push past that fear and just step on it with courage and keep moving. And when they did, amazing things happened. And so we did a lot of stories in this book because stories are metaphors for all of our lives. Metaphors are patterns and patterns are how our brain learns. So when we read someone else's story and they went through those similar fears, similar unworthiness, similar rejection, yet they push through it and you read about how they push through it and what happened and how they triumphed through their tragedies. Um, you realize very quickly that you can do the same. Mm. You, you talk about the, the in the book about the, the, the three people to ask, and one of them is being God. And without, I, I guess, you know, like people have got a lot of different views, and um, and uh, you know, how how if, if someone's sort of not, um, and this is this is, I guess is quite a difficult <laughs> question, but if someone's sort of not believing in what people think of God, you know what. What, what would you suggest? Um, I'm not, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I, I guess there's some people who are like, well, is there a God? Isn't there a God? What, how, how do you sort of deal with that um, question or concern? Well, okay, I'll, I'll let Mark answer this too, but I'll go first. I mean, you know, because I'm a scientist, I love, I'm a researcher. I love to study everything in research, but through all of, I, I've read so many books on near-death experiences where people, you know, completely lose their life and they're dead for five minutes and, and they go someplace completely different. Um, one of the most amazing books I read was uh, Eben Alexander's Proof of Heaven because he was a neuroscience who did, neuroscientist who did not believe in God. He had spent his lifetime saying to people who had these near-death experiences when they were having brain surgery, he'd pat him on the shoulder condescendingly and say, you know, it's, uh, you, you were experiencing this, you know, scientific phenomenon where your brain was discharging all these things. Well, then he died. He got some crazy virus in his brain when he was traveling in Israel. He died um, for quite a long period of time and he was actually brain dead completely. So they monitored his brain. So, and then he had this incredible experience of the other side. And it was his own experience, but he went through heaven, you know, a, a, play, a, a different place and came back a different man. And um, so I read a lot of that stuff. Um, another one, book I love is Dr. Gary Schwartz, who, who did the God experiments. And he, he tried to prove randomness theory that this whole, all of this amazing, intelligent universe that's around us um, was just randomly collided together. And he actually, has, it's really interesting science that he proved there's absolutely no way it could be random. So I would say for people um, who have a struggle with that, I think the struggle that I feel from people is that they don't have definitive answers or they don't like somebody else's version of God, you know, is that God's a, a little old man with a gray beard in the sky. And, you know, that's probably not what God is. I just, you know, so I, I would say open your heart and mind to the idea that none of us really knows exactly the form of God. But I absolutely know that God exists because I've had so many personal experiences, very deeply spiritual experiences. I know that benevolent, you know, benevolent beings exist. And I would just say, if, if anything, just take some time with your, you know, just to suspend your disbelief and say, you know, if there's something out there beyond what I know, you know, 
let me feel something. Let me let me feel the life in something because I don't think you can look at a baby coming to life, a newborn baby, and not not see. There's so many miracles around us. And, and in life, everything's really a miracle. I mean, if you ask me, but, um, you know, I would just say you really, it's just a process of suspending your disbelief. Um, some people like to just think of the living force of universe and everyone's journey, you know, is, is their own journey. I mean, we have to respect everyone's journey. Um, and I can only speak to my own, you know, so. Fantastic. So we're just wrapping up. I've got two more questions I wanted to ask, but but before I before I do that, I, um, you know, just what what stuff have you guys got going? You've obviously got the book Ask, which I would definitely recommend um, people checking out. It's it's Thank a you. very simple concept, three words, but something for whatever reason everybody's terrified in in most cases of doing as as, as simple as what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of that, what else? You know, how can people? sort of find out more about you what else have you got going on at the moment we would like them to go to our respective two websites crystal uh well so i'm at crystalvisionlife.com and i have a free resource there there's um a guided visualization audio it's pretty powerful called uh, purge messy thinking so that will really help people right now if they're going through some of these struggles where you have you know this messy thinking and come in some of these dark thoughts and it, it, it it's a pretty powerful audio um and then, of course, our, our book is at Amazon.com. And uh, if you buy the book and want to join the book club, uh, go to AskTheBookClub.com. And then, of course, Mark, you can find Mark at MarkVictorHanson.com. And Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the above, you know. Uh, same with me, uh, Crystal Dwyer Hansen, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of, all of the above. So we'd love to stay in touch with everybody. We love, you know. Uh, yeah, we, we try to answer uh, messages and things like that. So, yeah, Matthew, two questions ago, you were asking about business. And I let me ask, show you a real specific in California, which is the most shut down state with a governor. As far as I'm concerned, it's out to lunch. And I'd say that to his face. I don't <laughs> I don't mind. I mean, the guy now wants to do a wealth tax and steal more money from all the rich. That's one of the reasons we left California. Anyhow, um, Elon Musk was told he could not make his Tesla cars. Uh, in, in that wonderful state of California. So what he did is he went to 3M when they needed ventilators and said, I'll make ventilators. While they made ventilators, he simultaneously made 90,000 cars. He is now the fourth richest man in the world because he went over, under, around, or through the obstacle because the obstacles are mostly conscious where you buy into somebody else's bull. And that's what I'm saying is that we've got to get back to understanding who we are and ask ourselves, ask God and ask God, how are we going to get going? You know, somebody else could try to stop us, but we only can stop ourselves and, and no one can stop your thinking, even if you were incarcerated. Right. Yeah. And I, I'd love to say one more thing to that, Matthew. I mean, there's a lot of power in, in numbers. Um, you know, like all of the people who are in the gym and fitness industry, you guys have a voice. Come together. I mean, I know in Arizona, the gym owners felt really slighted because they did everything the governor said. And, you know, we, they opened up for a month and then they, they spent all this money getting prepared and distancing the machines and doing everything perfectly, spraying everything down the second everybody left and they got shut down again. So they filed a lawsuit and actually in our court right now, the, um, the court said they deserve to have their case heard. So they, they could win. I mean, they might get their way. So we can't give up. I mean, when you look at, you know, Everyone's opinion matters. And in this country, um, it's particularly true. I mean, we vote for the people who are in office. So it's very important that we make sure that our our voice isn't um, lost. We need to make sure our voices are heard. And when we share common ground, we should come together and make our voices heard. And I really believe strongly in that. Mm. Fantastic. So, final question, and I've never done this as a as a couple, but um, we'll see how, we'll see how this one goes. So, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed or, or other people have said is impossible and gone on to make it possible. As a couple, what would be a memorable example of where you've both escaped your personal limits? <laughs> oh, okay. So, I see. Fluke recruitness just emanating out of her in an LA seminar I'm doing. 
long story of how I got there, but I invite her to go to dinner. It's 930. Every, and I say, I can't stay in this property because every there's a thousand people here and they want two minutes of my time and I won't get to talk to you. And I want to talk to you, not them tonight. So we get to the Hollywood restaurant and the lines are long and a hundred dollar bill won't get you in. So we just go up and a guy looks at her and sees her immense beauty and says, okay, I give up. Who is she? I said, you don't recognize her? <laughs> and now his mind's going through People Magazine super fast, and, and he's on steroids and doesn't know what to do. And, and, so, and he says, okay, guy, I give up. Who is she? And we're both Danish. So I said, she's a queen of Denmark. He says, no, she's not. He said, oh, my God, she is. Who are you? I asked a question. I didn't tell him. I said, who travels with the queen? He said, oh, my God, you're the king. <laughs> and then we had a <laughs> And we were goofing, but it worked. It was a wonderful goof. Yeah, just really good. I, I, I think one of the most memorable, Mark and I have so many experiences where, um, you know, it just raise. we keep raising the bar and we keep being surprised by life. And, uh, but I think it's because we put ourselves out there, but some of our greatest memories are when we were able to go to China, we, we used to go to China a lot and speak and they are just so over the top with everything. And they're so hungry for the concepts we teach because you know, they look at us, we have this very individual expression of who we are and what we become. And that's something that all human beings, I think, crave. And so they love learning from us and learning all these principles. But, you know, pulling up to this resort one time and it was going to be our audience was going to be thousands of people. Mark and I were the two um, keynote speakers and we're driving along in a Bentley limo. And I look up and I see this big uh, billboard along the highway coming into the into the resort um and it, actually we just gotten off the highways like like on the city, city roads as we came in and i and i was like oh my gosh that's us <laughs> was a series of billboards and we get out of the car and we had you know this big security guard detail the whole time because it was going to be a big crowd and uh, just the whole experience we had so many experiences like that in china because like I said, I birthday. think they're just so hungry. Oh yeah, I, so one of, we were there over my birthday, September 6th, and uh, I finished my talk and they had surprised me. And suddenly our agent comes on stage with Mark and they each give me, their gift on birthdays is 99 roses clustered together in one bunch. So they Means gave me love. two bunches of 99 roses, these huge big things of tightly packed roses, one red and one pink. They bring two bunches of those out. And then two of these sweet Chinese girls bring me this uh, huge scroll out. It was one of the original famous um, Chinese silk paintings. And somehow they had circulated the scroll through the audience. I don't know when they did that. It must have been on a break. And it was and like had 40 every, or 50 feet long. Yeah. I mean, unrolled. And, the, giving and had it. thousands of people in the audience sign it oh. my birthday. That was <laughs> so special. Oh, my gosh. It was cool. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, I, I, I just like to say that um, from a personal perspective, like preparing for this interview and listening to your material, it's it, it, it totally made a big shift in my mind. And and you, like I said, you there's so much bad junk news and 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 it, which wears you down. But just spending a few days listening to your material, I'm I'm just you know totally optimistic, and I'm flying, and I'm. And not, not I'm a person that goes up and down all the time, but you've sort of, you know, you've, you've uh, put me on a bit of a high. So I just recommend to anyone, just just spend a bit of time. There's, a hundred, there's, there's tons of videos out there on YouTube that are all free. I daily buy the book because it's, it's not expensive. But I just recommend, you know, you guys are doing some great stuff. I know, Crystal, you've not mentioned about your, 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 your sort of think yourself thin stuff. And I recommend people have a look at that because I think that's a really interesting concept for people that are in the fitness space. And I, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time and sharing some positive news uh, for a change. So, so thank you so much. We Our loved every pleasure. minute. Thank we you, We love Matthew. being with you, Matthew. We're cheering you on. And, <laughs> and everybody. Yes, everybody. Reach out to us. <laughs>